Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Deb Goodkin and I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. So welcome to another FreeBSD Friday. I'm excited to have you here and uh, someday maybe we'll be able to do some of these talks in person. But the great thing about this is that uh, we record all these talks and so um, folks can watch this, uh, these talks whenever uh, they have time. So uh, today I'm going to get this started here. Um, well, actually, just to step back just a little bit, that these talks are geared towards um, introductory level talks of various areas of FreeBSD. And you can find the other talks on our uh, FreeBSD resource page, and we'll post that link in the IRC channel. Also, during today's talk, if you do have a question, uh, please feel free to post a question in the IRC channel and um, proceed it with a queue. So we know it's a question and you could do it during the talk. And we'll also have a Q&A uh, session at the end of the talk. So let's get started. Today's presentation is part two, using Git to track FreeBSD by Warner Lash. So if you remember back in August, we did part one. And the whole reason why it was part one is because Warner has so much information and he, and he realized that there was so much information he wanted to share with folks out there that he needed to break it into two parts. And so we're now um, able to do the second part. So it's really exciting. So let me tell you a little bit about Warner before we get started. Um, he has a fellow Colorado and meaning we're both here in Colorado in the US. So Warner has been involved with FreeBSD uh, for a number of years. And in his career, he's helped build everything from systems to measure the atomic clocks at NIST, which is actually here in Boulder, Colorado, to optimizing the servers that deliver you your Netflix shows and a lot in between. So today, Warner will be giving the talk on interesting ways to use Git to track FreeBSD. So now I'm happy to hand this off to Warner. <clears throat> Thanks, Deb. Let's see if the screen share is going to work today. And okay, so <clears throat> thanks, Deb. Uh, my name is Warner Wash. Um, this is a second talk on Git. This is primarily aimed more at the contributor to FreeBSD rather than the user. Uh, and it's also heavily slanted for developers of FreeBSD. This will be a good introduction for some of the more uh, advanced things that you'll be doing all the time if you are a developer um, <clears throat> or if you are contributing and uh, iterating on patches with people in the community to get them included. Um, so I'm gonna, give this basic outline of my talk, which um, I'm gonna go over a few techniques with Git that are applicable to anybody that's trying to track branches and submit changes upstream. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about a couple of FreeBSD specific tools to let you do that. And then I'll get on to some more developer centric talk topics uh, that will be uh, useful if you are a FreeBSD developer. Um, although a lot of the techniques used in them um, can be applicable in some situations if you're uh, working with other projects. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to assume that you saw my first talk. I have links in this talk to my slides and the last video. Um, I'm also going to assume that you have FreeBSD as the remote name for the FreeBSD repository. All of our examples in the handbook use that. I use that in my first talk. Uh, I'm also going to assume that you're using the SSH form if you're pushing anything. Uh, in order to push something into our repository, you need to have SSS, SSH access to it. Um, and that's how we accomplish uh, changes to the repository. The first thing I'm going to talk about is Git work trees. Now, Git work trees um, give you a chance to check out multiple branches from the same repository. And this can help in a lot of ways. Uh, it could keep different streams of work that you're doing separate. Uh, it also lets you share between the branches uh, a little uh, as well. Um, 
as opposed to having multiple repositories and just one branch per, it gets a lot harder to share when you, when you have that situation. It also saves on disk space, although a lot of people don't care about that so much these days. The Git repository isn't overly huge, but it can be a, a useful thing. Um, <clears throat> I use it and a lot of other people use it in conjunction with um, a tool that the FreeBSD project has called Git Arc. I'll talk about that in more detail later in, the, uh, in, in these slides. Uh, and people often use it to manage their um, MSC queues. Um, in the FreeBSD project, uh, MSC is merging from current. Um, it's basically when you put uh, the develop changes from the development branch into a stable branch. And I'll talk about that also a little bit later in the talk. <clears throat> and um, it's more familiar for people that um, don't want to switch branches in a single tree. Now I use a mix. Some people are, I use a work tree for everything. There's a work tree per individual branch that I have on one extreme. And there's other people who say, I never use work trees. I'll just check out different branches. I'm kind of in the middle. Um, and I'll talk a little bit as I go about when I choose one approach um, over the other. Uh, but first let's talk about creating work trees. Um, <clears throat> the get work tree uh, command has an add subcommand. And um, there's a variety of ways to create work trees. It's a very rich command. So I thought I'd go over a few. Let's say you have an existing branch. You've checked out stable 13 before um, and you want to create a work tree um, called stable 13. And um, this will uh, allow you to do that. Um, uh, the first bullet point here, uh, get work tree add, uh, you give it a path name and then the branch name that you want to create. <clears throat> um, and for that, uh, this branch has to already exist. Um, and now let's say um, you wanna use the workflow I talk about later uh, called Insta MFC, where as soon as you commit it to the main line, you commit it to a staging area. Um, I have a stable MFC 12 branch and a stable MFC 13 branch. In, that are branched from stable 12 and stable 13 respectively that I use for that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but if you wanted to create a work tree and also create the branch uh, from that, uh, you could do that um, with the second form where you uh, add a dash B. And then the third form is really the same as the second form, but um, I added it because it's, it's a small variation um, for when you haven't checked out stable 12 yet and, and you still wanna create a work tree for it. Well, the convention there is you use the remote name and the branch name. So here FreeBSD slash stable slash 12 is the uh, combination of the two names that you need and dash B stable 12 creates a stable 12 branch that tracks um, the FreeBSD stable 12. And then if you are cruising along and realize, hey, I need to create a branch uh, for a feature, um, I called my feature Fred feature because Fred, Wilma, and Barney are a number of my examples from a, a TV show that would uh, date me. The, um, but uh, the one thing that Git will do is if you don't give it a branch name, it will automatically create the branch name based on the last component of the branch. So um, I have dot dot slash you know, Fred feature here. You could have a big long path. Um, it doesn't matter. It just uses the last component um, a last directory of that for the branch name. And so um, managing work trees, um, as you use work trees, you'll find that you, if you have a bunch of them, it's like, how many of these do I have? Where are they? Well, the, it um, get, keeps track of all the work trees that you create um, it, with some uh, metadata in a particular file. So uh, these, these commands help um, manage that metadata and help you locate uh, the tree. So uh, get work tree list will list all the work trees that Git knows about, and you can use that for thinning. Um, sometimes you need to move a work tree from one place to another. Um, you change maybe the branch name, or you had a typo, or maybe from one disk to another, or one ZFS data set to another. Um, you know, whatever reason, this uh, lets you, uh, the, the work tree move command lets you do that. Um, and let's say you forget, oh, I have a special command to do that and you moved it or you copied it over and it's like, oh, I need to, I need to fix that. Well, fortunately, uh, this has been anticipated. Git work tree repair 
um, and point it to the new directory and it'll figure everything out from that point and adjust all the um, metadata if you moved it by hand because you know you're, you're kind of old school and it's like oh I just moved this oh why isn't this working oh okay I've had that happen a couple of times and um, <clears throat> so it's you know it's something that's easy to forget um, if you remove a root work tree uh, just by removing the directory you'll need to prune it so it's out of the list um, or you can use the get work tree remove which is actually what I would recommend um, because it makes sure that the directory is clean and um, there's no weirdness uh, that it can detect uh, before it removes it so that it's safe and you don't lose any changes. <clears throat> Another thing that you'll need to do is you'll need to do rebasing. Now I covered rebasing a little bit in my first talk. I'm gonna go into some more, a little bit more detail here. Um, I could probably do an entire talk on different ways to do rebasing. Um, I'll just hit uh, the highlights um, here. Um, so the first thing is, let's say you have a commit and it's under review and people say, hey, this is really a couple of commits or you decide, hey, I wanna do this as multiple commits. How do you break this commit up? Well, there's a couple of ways um, to do that. Um, the first way is by editing the commit directly. Um, and that's probably the, the, the easiest way to, 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 to do that. And that's gonna be the one that I talk about today. Um, so you use an interactive rebase, which is get rebase minus I. Um, and then the commit you wanna, you'll, you'll have a screen pop up and I'll show you an example of this later. You'll have a screen pop up with a bunch of lines that say pick and a hash and then um, a little summary of each of the commits. You get a bunch of those, you find the one that you want, you change pick to edit. Uh, and then um, exit out of the editor, uh, you'll get a message saying you need to uh, do a commit minus amend or uh, rebase minus continue uh, to, to continue on. Now, um, the next thing that I usually do is I, I do a get reset head uh, hat. And what that will do is it will um, roll back the repository one commit, but leave the changes in your tree. So you have the changes that you've made in the tree. The commit message is basically gone. I mean, the hash is still there. Um, in the repo, if you really need it, you can find it. But at this point, um, you know, Git is set up so that uh, the changes are in the tree. And then you can use Git add if you, um, you know, if you got changes to two files, Git add minus I will let you say, oh, I want this file and not that file, or these files and not those files. Um, if you have changes that are intermixed within a file, um, you would use Git add minus PI, and that will and I usually add a file name, uh, a specific file name to it, although it'll work on the whole tree or multiple files or directories. I usually just do it one at a time. It's, uh, if you have a lot of changes, it can get confusing if you do more than that. And what this does, it sits you into kind of a interactive patch editor. Uh, and that interactive patch editor lets you say, I want this patch and not that patch, which is relatively easy and straightforward. Um, and it'll also let you edit the hunks of the patch. So if you've got things intermixed, um, you can um, only do part of the patch. Now that's a little bit harder to do. It takes a little bit of practice. Um, and uh, there are a number of ways that you can screw that up, but I'll talk about, hey, what happens when you screw up your rebase a little bit later in the talk? So you don't have to you know, worry about that so much. <clears throat> Uh, once you're happy with the individual commit, you can do a git commit or git commit minus amend if you wanna uh, accumulate it gradually. And you can do multiple commits here, as many as you want. Um, and then once you're done, you need to um, do git rebase minus continue. And if all the changes are taken care of, that will work. And if it doesn't, it'll say, hey, you have changes you gotta resolve. And so you, you can resolve them um, either by dropping them if you don't want that part of the change anymore or by adding another commit. Um, the other thing that you need to do in the project is you'll post a review. I'll talk about that when I talk about Git arc later as, as one of the easier ways to do that. But regardless of how you get feedback um, from the review, uh, you'll, there'll come a time when you, you uh, make a typo and you need to change it or 
you need to do something. And um, there's two ways to do that. <clears throat> and the way that you do it depends on how complicated your patch series um, is. It's a relatively simple one, you'll use the second method. If it's a complicated one, you may need to use the first method, which is really just the prior method without the git reset at, at the start. You do a git rebase minus i, you change the pick line to edit, um, you go in, you change the files you want, you do a git commit minus amend like you, you would normally to curate your commit. Um, and then you do a git uh, rebase minus continue. Um, every time you do an edit, you have to do a git rebase minus continue. Um, it's uh, a little confusing because a lot of the other uh, rebase operations are, um, aren't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to do that. They'll continue automatically. Um, the other way you can do it uh, is that you can um, just make the change to the, the tip of the tree, like if it's just a typo, um, and then you can um, uh, do a fix up or a squash. I have fold on the slide, that's a mistake. I'm not gonna stop and correct it. Uh, fold is the old term from Mercurial's MQ command. And sometimes I get confused in my head. So I'll just use F uh, and fix up and fold, start with the same letter. But uh, anyway, when you do the get rebase minus I, you'll have the editor pop up. You change um, the line um, pick to uh, fix up or F. Um, and then you move it in the sequence of commits to just after the one that needs fixing um, and you save it out and um, it will go and it'll squash those two commits together, use the first commit message. If you need to modify the commit message for whatever reason, you can use squash instead. That'll rebase will give you a chance to um, modify it. Um, and there's no need to do a git rebase with this because you know once you've, um, uh, you know, once it's done its thing, it just keeps going. There's no, there's, it doesn't stop to let you interact or fix things unless there's a problem. Uh, so um, just to uh, give an idea, I have an example here of doing the, the, the second. I have a, a diff that I'm working on this morning um, for, uh, that had some wording changes to a manual. So I, um, I made the changes, I did a git diff to make sure that the changes are the only changes in the tree. Um, and then I did a git commit minus a m fold. Fold is the commit message, minus a is do it all. That's a little bit dangerous, which is why I did a git diff first, so I know exactly what I'm committing. Um, and then I did a rebase, and that popped me up into this editor like this, like I was, like I was saying, all the, 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 the lines show up, pick, hash, description for all of the commits in the tree. So I changed um, the uh, one I wanted to fold with F here for, for fold, um, or sorry, for fix up. The, what, sometimes when you get a term in your head, it, it really sticks. And um, so it, it comes out and your rebase is successfully. You don't have to do anything else. Your rebase is done. Um, so since it was a review I was in, I did get arc update. Um, and head hat, it's the, not the most recent commit on the branch, but the prior commit. Uh, and um, this sh you know, sh shows a little bit, I'll talk about the, the git arc command a little bit later, it's a FreeBSD specific command. But once I did that, um, I typed in a little message about why I did the change and it updated the change automatically. Um, it was very easy and very simple to, to do that. And I've gotten even more feedback since I made these slides a couple hours ago. Um, so some general observations about Git rebase. Um, <clears throat> if you are doing the rebase, it's complicated and things go terribly wrong, don't panic. Git rebase minus abort is like, okay, I've totally screwed this up and I just want to start over. Um, and it will roll back as if you hadn't done any of the rebase at all. Um, Sometimes there's ordering problems. If you have a long series of commits and want to make a little change that you think you can just fix up to the beginning, sometimes that creates conflicts and you need to figure out where the conflict is. Um, maybe the conflicts are really complicated because you have a bunch of changes to the file and you're not, didn't realize that this would conflict. One thing that you can do is you can, if you've got like 20 or 30 commits, you can move it up five or 10 lines at a time until you find the place that conflicts and deal with the conflict as you go. Um, back and once it gets back to the commit that's adjacent to that you want to fold it or um, fix it up with, 
um, you can just fix it up. Um, there are ways with the commit message to do auto fix up. Um, I generally don't use those, but if, if that's something you wanna, uh, if you don't wanna do an interactive rebase, you can use that. You might wanna check the manual for that. I'm not gonna talk about it much more than letting people know that it exists. Um, and then if things go terribly wrong, I've done 20 rebases because I'm trying to merge in a bunch of changes. Uh, uh, and I just, something terrible has gone wrong. I wanna back up a couple of remerges because I realized now that I screwed up two or three merges, uh, two or three uh, rebases ago. Um, there's something called Git ref log. Um, and it will give you a list of all the places where you've committed, um, all the hashes that you've committed in a history. Um, so you can go back and go, oh, I rebased here and I you know, applied these. Okay, that makes sense. You can look back, oh, this is the rebase I know was good. Um, I'm just going to check out back to that point and Git will let you um, check out minus capital B um, and that hash. Um, there's some notations that go along with it if it's one of the first few um, that are also show up in the log. You could use either one, it doesn't matter. Uh, but this lets you reset back in time. And the ref log will record this in case it's like, oh wait, no, I'm mistaken. I really did do it. get all, all these things right. I want to you know, undo that. You can, you, can, you can do all those things. Uh, again, since I'm trying to cover a lot of material, uh, I, I don't have time to uh, step through um, step through that, but um, it's, it's there for people to use. Next, I'm gonna talk about pushing changes. Now that you've got a tree, uh, a branch that you've curated, everything is good. You wanna push it into the repository. Uh, there's a number of things you can do. Now, um, the um, first thing that uh, you need to know is that FreeBSD requires a, a linear history um, in all cases except vendor branches. So no merge commits are allowed. Um, this makes it uh, much easier uh, to bisect changes. And there's a few uh, problems you get when you have loops um, because people have done uh, their change and then merged it forward rather than rebasing it forward. Um, the project uh, has decided uh, to have more of a linear workflow. Um, so you can either, um, uh, so you can e either locally stage the change in a branch named Mer uh, main and push that, or you can uh, stage the changes in a branch that you have named um, and you can push uh, that when you want to do the merge. Um, so there's, the project generally recommends that if you do um, git push freebsd uh, head colon main, what that says is push to the freebsd remote head, which is the current commit. Now this could be the branch name too, if you were pushing a branch that is fast forwardable. Um, and then colon main is the name of the branch on the remote. Now I usually just do git push freebsd and um, you know, that, usually works, but it's a little bit more dangerous and can be a little bit confusing if things go wrong, which is why we recommend the first one because it's a little more explicit when things go wrong, what you need to do. So we have to have a linear history. What happens if you lose the race? Um, the easy thing to do is just do a git pull minus rebase. That works for everything except vendor branches. And when I talk about vendor branches here in a little bit, um, I'll tell you the variation you need to do for that. Um, it's very easy, it's very simple, but some people don't trust it. They prefer to be more explicit. So if you wanna be more explicit, you fetch FreeBSD and then you rebase FreeBSD main on domain. Then, and the order seems kind of backwards here for how I would order it, but that's the order you give. You give the branch you want to take out, check out, and then the branch that you are rebasing relative to that branch that you've taken out is the order of the commands for rebase. And that will rebase your changes forward. You can then do a push. Um, do the push exactly like I did in the last slide. There's nothing special after that. This fixes it locally, so you can do the push. 
<clears throat> here's a, just another quick example where I did a git push. It said, nope, you can't do that. So I did a git pull rebase and it pulled it in and rebased my changes forward. And then I was able to do um, a git push um, as uh, normally. So no matter how good anybody is, um, there are other people in the world that um, will want to contribute in an area of the tree that um, you're competent to commit changes to. Um, so the project recognizes this and we make use of a Git feature um, for each of the commits. There's an author and a committer. The author is the person who actually wrote the change and the committer is the person who is pushing it into the tree. Now, a lot of the time for a lot of people's commits, these are the same because, hey, I made this change. I wrote this change. Um, I'm pushing it into the tree. But if somebody sends you a patch, you get a patch from um, a Bugzilla bug report or a GitHub pull request or you know some random branch from somewhere that somebody sent you, um, you can uh, uh, commit that change um, and set the author. Or you can pull that change from the uh, remote Git repository and the author will automatically be set. <clears throat> For the most part, this replaces submitted by. Now there'll be a few cases where you'll want to use submitted by, like <clears throat> if the author has doesn't want their email address in our repository, or um, they have a fairly anonymous um, email address. Um, there's uh, GitHub defaults to username at github.noreply.github.com or something like that. Um, we don't want any of those in the uh, repository. Uh, so if you get something like that, you just say submitted by GitHub user gerbil or whatever. Um, then um, if you're submitting somebody else's change and you extensively reviewed it and worked with them on it, um, some people will add a reviewed byline, even if they are the committer. Uh, there's a, an implied reviewed byline when somebody commits it because you're not gonna commit something you didn't at least look over. Um, sometimes people want to document that they did something more extensive. Um, sometimes not. It's, it's, um, there seems to be a diversity of opinion in the community about what the best thing to do here is. Um, and then when you push, you need to add um, minus minus push option equals confirm author. Because we have a um, sanity check that makes sure that the author is, uh, matches the committer and that both of those addresses have the proper FreeBSD dot org uh, form and uh, push option confirm author says, ah, don't check that. Um, I know what I'm doing, I've checked and everything is cool. So once you've um, gotten that, I'm sorry, my slides are being a little bit slow. Um, so the project has chosen to use uh, Fabricator. Now, um, the project knows that the, up, the, the, the old upstream for Fabricator is changing. Um, they've decided they're not gonna support it anymore. There's uh, some community led effort to support it. Uh, it's unclear what we'll do in the future, but today we use Fabricator. Um, Mark Johnson has written a tool called GitArc. I've, I've talked about it um, a little bit already and it lives in tools, tools, Git. So if you wanna use it, um, you need to check out a FreeBSD tree and uh, CD to tools, tools, Git and do a make all install clean to have it copy um, git arc into your path so the git space arc command works. <clears throat> and there's five commits that you need to, to, to know. Um, git arc create, when you have a change you want to get a review for, um, it will let you, you know, you, you specify the change you want on the command line after that, or you specify all the changes on this branch. Um, it, it handles uh, ranges. Um, and if you specify a bunch of changes, it makes them all children of each other so that um, they're linked in review board and people that are reviewing them go, oh, there's a change related. I can go look at that if I have a question or if I want to review it or whatever, for whatever reason. Um, Get arc list will show you the current, um, it will, will ask Fabricator, what are your open reviews for this person? Um, and then it will match up um, what you have. Um, if you give it a, a list of um, revisions, it will uh, show what reviews are open for those revisions. Um, 
I may have misspoke. If you don't give it any arguments, I think it won't do anything. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, a different arc command. So sorry for misspeaking there briefly. Um, get arc patch. If somebody's uploaded a patch into Fabricator and you want to look at it, um, it wraps the nuts and bolts about pulling that patch down and applying it to your tree. Um, it applies it to the tree, but doesn't commit it. So there's no commit message. If you're um, wanting to then curate this patch as something you're going to uh, push upstream, you'll need to commit it and you'll need to probably just go to the fabricator review URL and cut and paste the uh, commit message from that. That would be nice if it was more automated, but we don't have more automation as of this time. Um, now, once you've, um, you have a branch, you're all ready to go. Um, get arc stage um, and all the revisions on that branch, you know, main dot dot dot, or main dot dot feature name. If you have like, you know, feature name is the name of your branch that you're, you're working on. That will move all, uh, that will copy all of the changes from that branch on domain. And it will also pull metadata from Fabricator. So the people that reviewed it, um, what the revision is so that you don't have to fill all that in. It, it, it reduces the friction when you're trying to, to land um, uh, changes. Um, and then once you have that, you will push it like, you, like I talked about earlier in the top, just with the push or the conflicts in the push, whatever, either way. It's just no different from if it had been, you had done everything locally. Um, and then get arc update. If you get feedback from a review, you, like I showed you earlier, you can uh, get the feedback, make the changes, and then do a get arc update, and it will push the change back to review board, and everybody that's been reviewing it will give you that. Um, get arc makes all of these operations significantly easier, and it's worth uh, learning and installing. Uh, your, the time that you spend doing that will be paid back um, many times over if you do more than even just a couple reviews. I, I highly recommend it. So the other way that the project accepts uh, stuff from users is with Bugzilla. And as soon as the slide changes, I will talk about that. I'm not sure why my system is being slow today, but of course it's slow when I'm giving the talk. So um, <clears throat> FreeBSD has a port, um, the FreeBSD Bugzilla CLI that you can just package install. Um, it's geared mostly towards the um, uh, ports tree, but it also works for the source tree. Um, and I have listed here a number of the commands that, that um, it has. Um, the most interesting um, one is uh, um, BZ port commit. If somebody, is, if a uh, maintainer submitted a port and you're a ports developer um, and they need to do update the version, um, all of that is done by sending something to Bugzilla uh, and you can pull it down with the port commit command. Um, you can also use it to interactively search the Bugzilla database if you don't wanna use the um, web interface. Um, and this lets you also take or reassign different uh, PRs as well. Um, so you can also do a GitHub pull request. We mirror our repository to GitHub and GitLab and a number of other places so that people can use those mirroring services to publish changes that they um, want to share with other people or maybe even get into the FreeBSD project. So what I do is I've set up a, a remote called uh, FreeBSD GitHub and it's the remote is just the FreeBSD uh, repository. The example I show here is for the source tree. Um, and it should probably have freebsd-source because that's how we publish that, that today. Um, we have a compatibility link. So that's a, another small mistake on my slide. Sorry about that guys um, and gals, but um, freebsd, so that should say freebsd-source. And then I just do a git fetch um, freebsd github and that will pull down not only the changes that have been mirrored there, if I don't have them yet, um, it will pull down all the pull requests. Um, and the pull requests show up as a number of different branches. Um, and let's say I wanted to uh, bring in, you know, I've worked with somebody um, 
on GitHub, we've done a review and request one, two, three, four is ready to go. Um, so I would check out main, I would um, cherry pick main dot dot GitHub slash pull, oh, it's a secondary, dang it. Um, I would uh, mirror GitHub dash, sorry, freebsd dash GitHub slash pull slash one, two, three, four slash head. Um, and what that does is it pulls all the changes. I usually cut and paste this from the listing of branches that I see when I do the GitHub fetch. So I, again, sorry, I'll, I'll fix the slides once the, the talk is over so that they'll, they'll be correct. Um, anyway, at this point you have a number of Git commits. They're just like any other Git commits. Once you've tested them, uh, audited them, or you're happy, um, you can do a Git push. Um, and then again, you need the uh, push option confirm author uh, so that the author shows up. Um, one of the things you need to do is you need to make sure that um, all of the email addresses are good. If they're not good, you can go in and set yourself as the author and then say submitted by you know, GitHub user, whoever um, submitted them. There's a FreeBSD port also called GH that other people um, prefer that's less error prone. Given that I made two mistakes on this slide, perhaps it's a good idea to use it and I should think about using it. I thought that you know doing the manual stuff was easier, but clearly it's error prone. So um, unfortunately I didn't prepare to talk about it because I haven't been using it today, um, but it's just uh, package install GH and it's their standard tool. So um, there's a lot of documentation on GitHub on how to use that. Um, and you can also use a similar technique doesn't have to be GitHub, it could be GitLab if somebody's pulled, put, <clears throat> uh, posted a, um, a pull request, a PR to GitLab, uh, or they've just published a branch somewhere. Um, doesn't matter where, you can pull that in and do the same thing. It, it, Git makes this really easy to combine different um, branches from different repositories um, and commit them. So next I'm gonna talk about MFC in, in Git. Uh, MFCing is the FreeBSD project term for merge from current. And this dates from the days we use CVS when the main line of development was called current. It's FreeBSD current. We still have that in our uh, email address. Um, email mailing list, uh, FreeBSD current at FreeBSD.org talks about the most recent uh, version, even though we've renamed the branch to main to, to match um, or what we um, believe will be the get defaults. Um, you know, the, MFC is still the term that we use in the project. So generally speaking, commits need to be done to the main branch first, and then they're cherry picked to the main branch, uh, or sorry, cherry picked from the main branch to the stable branch. We use cherry pick minus X hash. Um, and what that minus X does is it automatically generates, this was cherry picked from hash version. Um, strictly speaking, Git doesn't necessarily need this, um, because it has um, some internal ways of knowing when changes have been merged verbatim. But if the main line and stable have changed in a particular area and you have to tweak it even a little bit, that tracking is broken. So we have kind of a belt and suspenders approach having both pieces. Um, some committers will um, do a, once they've cherry picked the change, they'll do a git commit minus amend to make it right from the point of view of that branch. Now, people did this more originally when we just switched to Git, and anymore people don't really do that. Um, some people will um, you know, merge a number of commits and then squash them down into one, particularly if there are bug fixes involved. Um, a lot of people also don't do that. Um, and we're still trying to work out as a project what uh, the um, consensus is. Uh, both seem to be fine, both don't seem to provide any problems, what, you know, some have, um, if you do the individual commits, uh, people feel that it's oftentimes easier to find which one um, failed with a bisect. And if you do the squash, people feel, well, um, I know some of those commits will break the tree. So I wanna commit something that doesn't break the tree. So um, even within, uh, there are some individuals that do one sometimes and another other times. Um, the MSC tags work as before we have um, a number of um, ways that do this. Um, now, there are two ways that people go about merging. One is they make the changes to current and say, oh, 
it's been a while since I've merged. Let me go find changes. And there's two ways that you can find changes. There's actually a lot of ways, but the two I'm going to talk about um, are the kernelnomicon.org um, website that has existed for a, a while. There was a subversion version of this. And this version of kernel nomicon um, gives you uh, basically the commands that you need to do the MFC. It helps you find the commands that are eligible, um, maybe the, that you've made or in different parts of the tree in case there are dependencies. Um, it's really nice if you're searching and, and like a GUI. Um, this rather long git uh, log command um, will show you uh, the files that have changes that are in main that are not in stable 11 in the whatever path that you want. Um, you can also use minus minus uh, one line to make the output smaller if you think there's gonna be a lot of them. And you can um, use minus minus author or minus minus committer to narrow the selection even further. Um, and both of these are good ways to find commits. Uh, but I find that I don't usually go out and find commits. Um, so I use a different uh, strategy uh, from the, the find strategy and that's the instant MFC strategy. Um, which I'll talk about as soon as the slide catches up with um, what I'm doing here. Uh, there we go. So the instant MSC workflow, what I do is I make a change to main. I know I'm gonna merge this if it's good. And so um, I have a branch, like I talked about earlier with work trees um, called uh, stable slash MSC XX. Now I, I name it that way because I have an automated script that automatically will um, rebase all of my branches to the latest version of main, unless their name's stable something. And there's a couple other tags I have, but um, I do that so that that script doesn't pick them up. Uh, that script is in the tree, um, but I don't know if anybody else uses it. If you do, I would be interested in finding out. Um, so, you know, you, to set this up, you create a uh, a working tree. Um, I have a working tree for stable 13, stable 12. I even have one for stable 11 still, although I don't really merge much to it. Um, as soon as I make a commit to main, um, I CD over to this working tree and um, make sure that I'm on the stable MSC branch. And then I just cherry pick main. Main is a perfectly good uh, name to use. It refers to the tip commit on main. And so when I cherry pick it, it's this commit that I've just that I've just done. Now, um, one caveat here is um, in order for the hash to be correct, uh, you have had to push this to the main repository. So oftentimes what really happens is I'll do a bunch of commits and then I'll give a range of commits here when I cherry pick them. Um, it, it operates the same. It's a little more complicated but you know, it's, it's not that hard to generalize from the, the, the single example I have here. Um, and then every so often I'll rebase this um, queue of things forward. And when I have a few minutes, um, I will um, figure out which ones I, I want to merge into um, stable 13. If I have a lot, I'll probably uh, do a rebase and reorder the, the, the commits so that the ones that I want to um, merge right now and push to the repository are first. And what that lets me do is um, I can uh, check out um, stable 13, and then I can say uh, git merge minus minus FF only, and then the hash of the last one of those. Since it's a fast forwardable um, thing at this point, it moves forward and then I can push and then play the, I lost the race game, if, um, just like I talked about earlier in the talk. Um, it's no different than any of the other scenarios where you lose the race to push. And there's some port specific information um, that I'd like to, to share. I've been kind of uh, uh, source centric and um, there are some port specific stuff that uh, um, people need to know about, um, whether it's uh, active ports committers or people that just like me commit to the ports tree every once in a while. And um, I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, the ports tree has a number of um, additional checks for the commit hooks. 
Um, earlier, I talked about how the source tree checked the author for validity. Um, the uh, ports tree uh, has a number of additional checks as well that um, <clears throat> I have listed on the slide that isn't coming up um, that I'll talk about here in a second. And it's a fairly long list and it's uh, designed to keep um, the history of ports a little bit cleaner and catch a lot of the common mistakes uh, that go on with the ports tree. Um, so um, I have the whole big long list here. Basically, um, there's a number of files that, uh, and file names that the ports tree is trying to move away from. So you're not allowed to commit ports that have those file names in them. And these are things like uh, core or makefile.local, which never should be in the repository. Um, a long time ago, we would use colon or colon colon or at to separate path components in patch names. We don't do that anymore. So we have a commit hook for that. Um, empty files, um, the vulnerability database um, has to be um, uh, done specifically for the vulner you know, vmurl.xml files. I mean, I can't go to the quarterly branch. Um, you know, quarterly branches are have to be cherry picked or it has to be a direct commit that you specifically say, hey, I know this is a direct commit. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, also uh, commit messages should have category port colon whatever um, as their first line. Uh, but it's act the actual check is you can also, it's, it's anything colon whatever. So you could say clean up colon, replace all foos with bars or whatever. Um, and you know that's also an allowed thing. You don't have to override the subject. If there's a particular reason that your subject is good, there's a, there's a safety valve here. And it also has a check to make sure that the commits aren't in the future. Um, so that um, the history in the repository is a little bit uh, saner. Um, quarterly branches, for those that don't know, are a part of the ports tree that um, you know, when we take a snapshot at the beginning of each quarter and we only have one of them active at any given time. And they are uh, security fixes, uh, bug fixes, and low impact uh, new features. Sometimes they're tolerated if they're coupled uh, with a bug fix or security fix. Uh, my computer is acting, it's really frustrating me today because it's not letting me go from slide to slide. So that's the, the quarterly branch. Um, and then I have a few slides on vendor branches after that. Um, but if this isn't, um, so, oh, okay. So I will see if this presents a little bit more quickly. Sorry for the smaller um, size. Uh, the FreeBSD tree um, doesn't have merge commits except for vendor branches. And vendor branches are basically um, the files as they are in the upstream repository. Um, the FreeBSD project does not use um, submodules uh, because uh, there's a lot of reasons, and I don't have reasons to get to all of them in the talk, but they're a poor fit for the project. Um, they have a lot of extra overhead that um, is just overhead for the project because currently none of the submodules provides any of the benefits. Most people do submodules just as an aside for times when the, the submodule could be QA'd or um, have continuous integration done independently and then <clears throat> merge forward. Um, since we don't have any of that infrastructure set up, submodules are nothing but uh, difficulty uh, because as you're moving forward, groups and forwards after uh, submodule points, um, you get a dirty tree and it's easy to accidentally revert a submodule change. And so for the moment, the project is not using them. What we are using is vendor branches. And what we do on a vendor branch is you copy the files from the vendor source um, into the branch, you make a commit, um, this example uses one true um, from when I was merging it. Um, it does a subtree merge. So 
emerges from the vendor branch into a particular spot in the tree. Um, so when I do an awk update, um, I merge into source contrib one true awk, uh, and it uses um, the, the merge command and either it works and you, all you need to do is maybe adjust the commit message when it pops you up in the editor, or maybe you need to fix a couple of conflicts um, and then fix the commit message to note that, oh, and I fix these conflicts. To, to, you know, sometimes uh, some people change stuff in source contrib directly and that will conflict in the next import. Um, the next thing you do is you create a annotated tag uh, because this lets us push uh, those tags upstream um, into our repository, but not the tags you have locally. Otherwise, um, you get too many tags in the repository. This tries to, vendor branches try to strike the right balance between having too many branches and too many tags um, in the repository where if we tagged every little thing, we would, um, uh, versus you know, having some information so that if I'm unable to do the next awk import, say there's um, details that are in the repository that people can start from so they're not starting completely from scratch. So we pull all this together. Um, we update um, the subtree. Um, we do a git commit with the new version. Um, we tag it and then we push it to the um, vendor, we push the vendor branch to the repository. And then we um, do uh, the subtree merge. Uh, into main and push that up. Sometimes though, it takes a while to do this. It takes a while to resolve, it takes a while to test and you'll lose the commit race. Well, what do you do? Well, you still just do a git rebase, um, but you have to give it the command git rebase merges. Now there's a couple of different ways that git has decided is a good idea over time to do merges. Um, and this is the one that actually works for our repository. Um, and again, you, you, you rebase, um, this way, typically there are no conflicts, but if there are, you need to resolve them, um, get everything committed, and then you can do your push. And with that, um, we are back to questions. Um, and uh, we will go from there. So I will stop sharing. And what questions came in on IRC? I didn't have... Um, I have my IRC client up uh, and I don't have the um, previous D Friday um, Slack up either. So did we have any questions that came in during the talk? So, so far, no questions. Oh, wow. Either, <clears throat> either everything was crystal clear or I was completely unintelligible today. <laughs> I'd like to think yeah. the former, but I think it's probably a myth. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that I was asked late to add to the talk and I didn't have time to add was signing. Um, and there were a couple of um, uh, requests that have come in for um, uh, Sarah CI and uh, how can I use that? Um, uh, so I think I might have a third talk because I was, I felt like I was racing through that and we're here you know, with five minutes left. And both of those topics are a good 10 or a 15 minute topic each. So in another couple of months, I might have part three. I know it's a, it's, it's a, ter it's a crazy thing to say uh, <laughs> live in front of everybody uh, being recorded, um, but uh, I think uh, that might be a thing. But if there's uh, no further questions, I guess we can call it a wrap. I guess so last call for questions on IRC. If anybody's on IRC and wants to ask a question, um, that would be a good thing to do now. <laughs> I don't see any questions in the obvious places. So I guess that's a wrap. I'll hand it back to Deb. That's great. Um, yeah, I think I ha already have it in my calendar now for uh, part, get part three. And uh, it'll well, be maybe July. I'll Maybe we'll have to do a Netflix series on this and uh, <laughs> folks can binge watch. But yeah, thank you so much, Warner. Um, I'll, get, I'll get those up on the OCA. I'll see, I'll see what my management <laughs> has to say about that. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's always great having you. Uh, you did a 
fireside chat. I think it was at the vendor summit last late last year, and you could do what ten parts of the history of Unix. And so, um, it, it, you know, I feel like we're so lucky to have you um, available. I know you're really busy and uh, willing to uh, share your knowledge with other folks, especially new people to the project. So, um, so anyway, I want to thank you again. Uh, well, for thank, thanks for your kind words, Deb. So, um, so right now we don't have anything scheduled for our next topic, uh, but I did want to throw this out there that if there are any topics that you'd like to learn more about, please let us know and you could um, either post those topics in the chat or you can always uh, tweet them to us uh, to however you want to get that to us because we're always looking for areas that really people are interested in learning about. And um, and so besides talks coming up, I think the only other thing, uh, it's not official yet, but we do know BSD CAN is online. I mean, that is official and that's in early June, uh, but the, the free BSD Developer Summit will, um, an official email will go out next week. I don't think it's gone out yet. And that will be uh, two weeks after BSD CAN. So, um, so that will become official once that email goes out. And I hope folks uh, will join us for that too. So um, great. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks for watching and uh, don't forget to watch part one if you've missed that. And uh, I think it's on Netflix, on your Netflix app. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I should probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, not, 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 not quite yet. I don't. I haven't been able to uh, get that uh, on that venue. You have to watch it on uh, the foundation's YouTube channel. Yes, which has a lot of good, good videos there. So anyway, thank you, everyone.